<laughs> no, I think this is all very important. It all goes hand in hand. Um, the technology, what we've been saying for a while is the technology exists to really transform transportation for the 21st century. Um, and, and we've seen it, you know, we've seen it develop over the last eight years and it's just getting better and better and more and more appealing to people. The, the aesthetics are better, the range is better, the power is better in terms of climbing hills and go, being able to go quickly across town. Um, and so the technology really in our, we've been seeing that the technology really exists to, to really make a huge impact and it's already happening around the world. So it's happening in China, they sold about 35 million electric bikes last year. In Japan, they've been selling millions of electric bikes every year for the last 20 years. Um, in Europe, it really started taking off in the last 10 years and electric bike sales have just skyrocketed. Um, and it's the biggest part of the bike industry now. And in the United States, surprisingly, electric bike sales last year were, lar were greater than electric car sales. So I just learned that, yeah, 200, 80,000 electric bikes were sold last year in the US and I think it was like 240,000. So anyway, that the reason we, we wanted to um, have this discussion is the technology really exists but there's also, there's a policy need to sort of get ahead of this. And as you might have read in the news, you know, there's a lot of discussion, at least in San Francisco right now, about scooter share and where and where, the, you know, where and where not they should be parked. And there's a lot of turmoil. Um, and there's, all, there's been turmoil with Uber and Lyft and, and how they integrate in the cities. And in many instances, it feels like you know, policy sometimes is a little bit playing catch up. And, and, um, and the hope is that, you know, especially with all this technology, we can, we can get ahead of it and really open up the doors so we can make a big difference. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce our panel here. So, I have Stephanie Moulton Peters. Stephanie is the um, the uh, mayor of Mill Valley. So that's a city council that rotates, but for the year, you are the mayor. And um, she is really interested in environmentalism, in human scale transportation. And I'll let her also describe a little bit that, of this too. I won't do all the descriptions. Um, next, I have Ariel. Um, Ariel is Ariel Fleischer is a policy planner for Spur. Spur, if you're not aware of who Spur is, Spur is a, an organization that's existed for a long time. How long has Spur About been? About 100 years. 100 like years. Yeah. Doing um, sort of yeah. policy planning for the Bay Area, greater Bay Area, Bay Area um, and is really on the forefront of pushing the Bay Area to meet its destiny a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, next, I have Fareed. Um, Fareed, how do you pronounce your last name? Javandel. Javandel. Uh, Fareed Javandel is the transportation manager for the city of Berkeley. And the city of Berkeley has done some really interesting things with bicycle infrastructure, with bicycle boulevards. Um, and you've been the, the manager for... For 10 years now. 10 years. Um, and before that, you were on the city council in Albany. Correct. And the mayor of Albany. Right. And I got to... One of the advantages of being on the city council there was I got appointed to the Alameda Transportation Commission as well, which allowed me to kind of broaden our focus on uh, sustainable transportation. Awesome. Next, uh, we have Jim Elias. Jim Elias is, a, uh, is the head of the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. You've been the head for 10 years? Oh, wow. No. Um, four years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, four years. It feels that's, like... that's either good or bad <laughs> that you think it's 10. Um, but we have had a fantastic time working with Jim. Jim is really, you know, really understands the technology, understands where things are going, under, and it really has a passion for, for, you know, transforming Marin into a, a really cycling-friendly place. Um, and he's been great to work with um, from the very beginning when we first met, like two and a half years ago, when we were about to open the store here in Marin. When Brett and Corin first came in, sat down and talked to us, and. and we have the pleasure of, of meeting a lot of people, but uh, very early on, I saw that combination and thought, they're gonna make this work. This is gonna be a good thing for all of us. And then finally, um, at the end is Damon Connolly. Damon is the District 1 Supervisor for uh, Marin County. That's San Rafael and the unincorporated areas. Um, Damon cycled here from uh, San Rafael today 
he's you're on your challenge right now, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, can you talk about the the challenge? So uh, the challenge, personal challenge, is forty five days not driving a car. No single occupancy Woo. trip. So, right. thank you. So, all bike, all transit, occasional carpool, and it's hashtag Ride with Damon. If you want to join me, uh, send in a photo. Let me know what's working, what's not working out there. So, I uh, did change my shirt for this. <laughs> it's on TV, but about a forty-minute ride to get here. So, not so too if you bad. do ride with Damon and you're riding an e-bike, just turn down your assist, because Damon doesn't have an e-bike yet. <laughs> I, I tried it, and uh, I am intrigued. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but Stephanie, you have an e-bike. I do have an e-bike, and I bought it a couple uh, months ago, and I, I absolutely love it. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm in my 20s again because of the power assist, so I never worry about high hills, and I don't worry about long distance rides anymore because I have some assistance when I need it. So I, it is a game changer, truly. So how many, how many here in the audience have ridden an electric bike? Nice, we're doing good. Um, how many on the panel have ridden an electric bike? You gotta get me on a bike. We're doing good. Well, that's why you're at Super Bicycle. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's that's a huge step. I think you know when we started eight years ago, there was most people hadn't ridden an electric bike, and when we talked to political leaders, there wasn't you know there wasn't even an awareness of what this was. So, how did you see what what do you make of the technology? You talked a little bit about this just now, but what how have you seen the change in your own life? Stephanie. In terms of the, the technology, the, the e-bike technology. So, so first, new modes of transit. Yeah, first I, I want to compliment you, Brett and Alistair in particular, who took me on some test rides and allowed me to see the technology and how easy it was to use, because I'm not a technology person. I just want to get on the thing and go. And you really can pretty much do that with these. Um, I think Marin County has been working very hard to build the bicycle infrastructure we need so that people can ride any kind of bike, but the e-bikes are going to allow the kind of distance riding that I think people are looking for. Ariel, on the policy side, has, is there an understanding on, in, at SPUR about new, new modes and new technology? Um, I think the way we put it, if, it, if it's not a car, let it flourish whether that's a scooter or an e-bike or a regular bike, um, how do we make human scale or personal, personal mobility, how can we really actually scale that up and make it so it's easier for people to choose to bike or walk, to you know, use a bike chair, docked or not, um, to go about their day? Why, is, really why are cars problematic? <laughs> from, from Spurs' perspective, I, yeah, I, I have my ideas, but... <laughs> I really think that, you know, problematic isn't necessarily the word I'd use. I think it's more about, do people have choices, right? So can I, can we build a system and a bicycle network and a transit network whereby you have enough choices where you could live your life on one of those modes and kind of like what Damon's doing and have that car be um, an, an option there when you need it. But how can we make kind of the default, the sustainable choice be more of that default and that's what takes more bike lanes, that more forward looking policy. Um, things of that element to really create the conditions that support these behaviors so that, again, you really only need to drive when, it's, when it makes that most sense in that yeah. uh, Fareed, the Berkeley is, has, seems to be on the cutting edge of this in terms of, of making those, making space. Um, was that your doing? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm implementing the policy for Berkeley. Uh, we, we do have input into the policy. The, the making space really kind of uh, comes from how do bikes get around. So rails to trails type of stuff is really easy for us. Uh, but bike lanes where you're converting traffic lanes to, to make the bike lane, that can be challenging. People think you're going to cause congestion. Um, you do a road diet and you add left turn lanes and suddenly people realize all the congestion is coming from those darn left turns and one lane of traffic is perfectly good if it's not held up by left turns. So there are things that people don't anticipate that we're able to solve. Right now what we're faced with is people who are concerned with parking spaces being converted. And if we're deploying a bike share station and we're giving up a couple parking spaces, that's the way people would phrase it. We have to tell them, no, we're converting car parking spaces into a whole bunch of 
bike parking spaces. So the, the net parking capacity just went up. And if more of the people who are moving, especially in a college town like Berkeley, students who move to Berkeley, if they can get around on a bike or car share or some other mode, they won't bring a car with them. That's one less car parking space demand. So trying to get that thought process out so people are evaluating on a different basis and get them out of their old paradigm and thinking about, really, this is a transformation. It's not necessarily and, it's instead of a car, someone's going to use a bike. That can really change it. Jim, do you look to different like examples in different parts of the Bay Area when you're thinking about Marin bicycle infrastructure or bicycle planning that you're doing for, for bicycle uh, policy pushes? Yeah, of course. Um, there are, are, are fantastic examples, but let me circle back for just a quick second to say thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Karin. Thank you, whole new wheel team for uh, hosting us, having us here today. Um, we're uh, we're uh, really uh, impressed with what you've done in the short period of time and your support of MCBC is really important to us. And if you'll uh, bear with me just a little longer. How many people out there support MCBC? Hello. Yay. Thank you. To answer your question, <laughs> we, do look, we do look around. Marin, um, though, is, um, it has its own characteristics. It's the oldest county in California by average age. Um, it's uh, a relatively well-to-do county for all the opportunities that brings and some of the challenges. And it has some historic, um, uh, I'd say, ways of thinking that uh, also provide at times challenges. It's also a place where change is occurring quickly. So from our perspective, we obviously don't lay the concrete for the pathways and so on. What we're trying to do is set a tone and organize the voices that are making the case that we want a future that makes it just as easy to get on our bikes as get in our cars. So the examples that exist around us are instructive, but the inspiration that makes us uh, want to uh, get on a bike as opposed to getting on a car is really where we start. We start with the why, and we know that people won't get on bikes unless they feel safe on their bikes, and that's why we concentrate on infrastructure development. We need the pathways, we need the north-south greenway built out, we need the east-west greenway completed so that people will feel safe to get on their bikes and get around from place to place. Damon, you are on, you're on a number of committees. You're on the, the um, Marin's Climate Change yes. uh, Mitigation Committee. So I'm all about transportation. Yeah. So it, in my role as a supervisor, I'm also Marin County's and all the towns and cities of Marin's representative on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is where all the federal and state money for the whole Bay Area comes through to our local communities. Uh, local transportation boards, and of course my own personal interest uh, in the subject. And how, how do you see that sort of the, how do you take like the vision from like an MCBC and combine it with the, your constituents and kind of synth synthesize that into something that, you know, happens on the, on you know, the, where the money gets spent, I guess you could say. Well, I'm excited about it. And I think, uh, you know, Marin has shown leadership in the past. We were one of four communities nationwide uh, that was part of the non-motorized pilot program uh, between 2005 and 2010. We pumped in over $20 million uh, into our communities in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. It resulted in the Cal Park Tunnel Hopefully you've had an opportunity to ride through that. That was a game changer. Um, miles of new pathways. Jim said it exactly right. Ultimately, it's going to be about making this alternative safe and convenient. Uh, when I was riding down here uh, this morning from North San Rafael, um, I was struck by the fact that, by and large, I can now take a dedicated pathway including the fact that now, and check it out if you haven't, it's gonna be a, a program that's now in place as a pilot 
You can go on Tamil Pius in downtown Center Fell from Mission to Third on a dedicated bike boulevard now, completely separated from traffic, painted, uh, which is something we've all advocated for for a long time. Let's get the paint out, you know, as an initial step. Uh, but we know there's gaps in the system still. Two notable ones that we're working on are right down here in central Marin, the north-south greenway. There's a gap where you now have to kind of go along that frontage road and intermingle with cars and entrances and exits from businesses, etc. Working on that. The other is the multi-use path that will be commensurate with SMART getting uh, extended to Larkspur which, by the way, will be completed by 2019. So we want to get a dedicated multi-use path along that stretch to also close that gap. So as far as e-bikes, I've got to say um, I was very intrigued riding one, and a couple things stick out to me. Number one is it could be a game changer to broaden the number of folks who can utilize this mode of transportation. I happen to do my ride with an 85-year-old friend of mine, uh, Terry, if you don't mind me giving you a shout-out, he's here today. <laughs> Frankly, put me to shame, but that's another issue for another day. But um, the fact that uh, folks at all ages can be out there utilizing it, um, you know, because the bottom line is we want to give people different, uh, safe, convenient ways of getting around. Do you... Do you say, I mean, I guess this is for the whole panel, how does, how does this new technology um, change how you plan? Does this make, make you bolder in, in plans that you, you think of? Or is this, does this um, say, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's an evolution. We'll see where it goes. You want me to this start with the that? Panel, yeah. Yeah. So where we're going is we have to think of this, if we're really talking about a transportation mode beyond recreation, which we also love, how does it fit in with the overall system? So first and last mile, uh, what you're seeing with SMART, for example, is a lot of folks bringing their bike onto SMART. If you uh, have an electric bike assist situation as well, that just extends that amount of, of uh, distance that folks are uh, willing to do that. Same with buses. Um, you have the ability to throw your bike on the bus. Um, so we have to make sure that um, those opportunities are expanded, that even within the transit system, and Ario can speak to this too, we were just at a great forum, that different systems themselves are coordinated. That's not often the case. Um, those who've missed a transfer now or or struggled to, to meet connections. So it all fits in together, and I think the technology going forward is part of that as well. I'll add to that, um, just as Damon said, in a few words, you grew the constituency. Uh, the, the number of people who can uh, utilize uh, an active transportation system has I don't know, it's going to triple, quadruple, whatever that might be because of all the reasons Damon just called out, first and last miles, uh, opportunity to cross uh, certain hills that might be too much, uh, and, and for something to work, to build on the previous comment I had offered, it has to be safe, but it also has to be fun and functional. All of those things taken together are really well illustrated by what's here in front of us today. So it, it really does take uh, the, the movement and uh, uh, require that the tent's a lot bigger to fit everyone under it. So I definitely echo that we want to have accessible transportation choices and e-bikes essentially <clears throat> extend that accessibility to people who maybe weren't interested in biking based on age, physical ability, the type of terrain in which they have to ride, the distance, and in some cases the, the traffic conditions. And, and the, the last part is kind of a, a piece that our latest bike plan in Berkeley really has delved into, 
um, because we, we've essentially completed all but like two blocks of our bike network. Um, but what's missing is the qualitative aspect. Yes, it's there, there's, there's a line on a map, but what does that line represent? What's the user experience? Is it fun? Uh, does it feel safe? So we, we categorize our bike facilities by level of traffic stress, one through four. Um, so the idea is you want to have a low stress environment. You're going to get more people riding. And part of the reason that's important to us, in Berkeley we did a, a, a statistical analysis, a polling, and identified that about 3% of the population in Berkeley, not just cyclists, but everybody in the city of Berkeley will ride a bike no matter what we do. They're out there, they're riding, they're, they're strong and fearless. We've got another 16% who are, uh, you know, comfortable, confident, but they're going to avoid those high-stress locations. You've got a great bike path, but then it crosses a freeway interchange, like, you know, I can't get from the good bike path to the good bike path because the piece in the middle is really uncomfortable and I can't you know, ride there you know, with my kids. Um, and that kind of brings us into the, the third group, which is I'll get to in a moment, but the fourth group is 10%. 10% of our population isn't going to ride no matter what we do. So we're not trying to satisfy them. But there's 71%, more than two-thirds of our population, who are interested in cycling, but they're concerned. They don't feel safe, they don't feel it's accessible, all, all these different things. And if we can get them the, the low stress environment, if we can get them the feeling that with an e-bike, that hill isn't so daunting anymore. Um, you know, I can get there and I won't be worn out. Uh, when I first uh, started taking classes at UC Berkeley and riding from my home in Albany, I, I rode a bike. In high school, I rode a bike. I, I got to my physics lecture and after that last uphill, I was exhausted. Like, I can't do this. I was in good shape. Uh, yeah, I ran cross country, all kinds of stuff. But to me, that was a barrier. So my primary vehicle in college was a, a scooter. So essentially I got a motorcycle license, I could ride a scooter. Now, I'd be looking at an e-bike, not going to you know, a, a gasoline powered vehicle. And I think that that change in the opportunities available to us as individuals, as planners, as cities implementing these facilities is really big because it means there's so much more we can do and now with our targeted focus, we know which constituency we're working on. The 3% don't matter because they're going to use anything we put out there. 10% aren't going to use anything no matter what. It's the people in the middle. That's our audience. That's who the e-bikes appeal to. I want to, I, we just got back from a trip to Bern, Switzerland, um, and what was interesting about Bern was the infrastructure was felt about on par with what we have in, like, San Francisco or Marin. Like, it, actually, a little worse than Marin, I would say. It was not, it was not what you would have considered, like, you know, it's not Amsterdam or Copenhagen, and yet the cycling, the number of people cycling was just astronomically higher, um, and the number of e-bikes was about 20, it was about 50 or 60 percent uh, of the bikes that were on the road were e-bikes, and 50 or 60 percent of the bicycles on the road or on the vehicles on the road were bicycles. And I, it, was, it kind of struck me because I've always been a thinking, feeling like infrastructure is the most important thing, and I still feel that way. Um, but it's the cultural aspect is is interesting, and you know, as an as a as a another example of that, like I. I had a meeting at, uh, at uh, the Transportation Authority, or what is it, uh, yeah, Authority, the Bay Area Transportation Authority, and I know, you know, there's a transportation, there's one of the head honchos lives in San Anselmo and drives to the ferry to, you know, to take the ferry into where, I'm not going to name any names here, but I mean, that was kind of striking to me, so what is, what do you think the, the duty, or I guess the, where does the leadership the political leadership come into all of this in terms of like, in terms of the cultural change aspect. I mean, we see it as our, that's part of our, that is our mission really, is a cultural change mission. But I think, you know, I would love to see, you know, on the political side, I think a lot of politics, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily, doesn't want to be too, you know, straightforward on what we're trying to have you do. But, you know, the car got to where it was because it was decided yeah. that that was the way we we're going to be. Yeah. So I want to chime in on that, and I, I just want to say that I am very privileged to work with my colleague, Damon Conley, 
And the two of us do the same thing. We model the behavior we want to see. Like, I got the electric bike after being a bike rider since childhood, but I, I want to model that, and particularly for women. And I want to uh, do it in a way that says you can wear your nice clothes and go to the, your workplace, and you don't have to break a sweat on an e-bike. So I do think political leadership means modeling the behavior. I think, Farid, you made some excellent points, uh, as well as the rest of the panel. It has to be safe and enjoyable looking, and that's our job as policymakers to get the infrastructure in place. Uh, and, and we have to do other things, the qualitative. Uh, safe Routes to School program that Marin County piloted has the five E's to encourage cycling, and they are education, how do you cycle safely, encouragement, how do we make it fun and interesting? Uh, enforcement of the rules for all users, cars, bikes, and pedestrians. Engineering of new facilities. And evaluation of how are things working. So you have to have all these ingredients. And I agree, we're working on the infrastructure. It takes time to put it in place. But you'll see in the next couple of years, we are going to have these connections that Damon mentioned. So we'll have that, then we just got to get more people out there trying them out. And, and that's something that uh, MCBC is huge in, you're huge in, uh, and so the policymakers need to join in. Yeah. And I'll add, I think that you're, with the advent of bike share and new jump bikes and the dock bus, you have this new real constituency that suddenly you have a lot more people biking, you have a lot more people exposed to biking, and I think that actually helps people who who are trying it for the first time realize, oh, it's, it's good to see people biking in my city. I like biking. I want to support this. And I think they're kind of, these new modes are really helping us democratize, um, democratize biking or scooting or walking and putting people in shoes that they had never been in before. I'm um, going to steal your anecdote when you said that people who, um, since like the Atkins Jump, which is a dockless bike share in San Francisco and also uh, Ford Go Bike now has e-bikes, you've seen a growth in people purchasing e-bikes. And I think that really speaks to it is like when you start trying these modes and a kind of safer, more comfortable environment, you realize just kind of how fun it is and how easy it is. And, and to me, it's really all about those the, creating the conditions to support the behaviors. When I get to the smart train, there's ample biking, or that they, I have a, a place in the front of the bike, the, the bus to put my bike. So really thinking about how are we creating the conditions that are, again, supporting this behavior. And, you know, I do think it's really good when your leadership, you know, tries out the tries out transit and misses that connection and know, know, knows what that feels like. So we prescribe a bike lane, because um, I think it helps really personalize it and, and, and help people understand like, what their constituents are feeling. Um, but again, I think we're, we're having this kind of swelling of urgency as more people become familiar with biking, as more people try it out, and then and you're going to see maybe a turn in, in how people are really approaching these modes. I've always, I mean, I think it's interesting. We were just interviewed by KPIX, and they were talking about the scooter, the e scooters, and what we think about that. and it feels like often, you know, the the lead, and even you know, with the new wheel, like we're we're a business. You know, our lead, the lead has been on the business end, and we do it for other reasons other than you know just selling bikes. But at the end of the day, we are a business. I'm personally, and Karen, my wife, is personally very excited by politics that is really like inspirational. And you know, we were this might be controversial here, but you know, we were like Bernie Sanders supporters, and you know being our age, you know, it's like, you know, seeing someone who really, is seeing pol politics that is really bold in the vision, where where does that fit into this, to the next phase, would, would you say? I can take a stab at that. I would say it's crucial that really to bring the vision about, you have to get involved in the process. Um, Right now, in particular, um, what, I, what I've characterized this year at, as is we actually have an opportunity to make a generational imprint on transportation this year. Um, you're looking at a situation where on June 5th, voters throughout the Bay Area and each county will be able to vote on Regional Measure 3. Um, that's going to bring a lot of different transportation improvements, including locally here in Marin County, some crucial congestion projects. The fact is it also will inject $150 million in, in new monies into improving uh, bicycle and pedestrian options in the Bay Area as a start. 
We have Senate Bill 1, statewide, which is now in jeopardy, which is a new crucial um, source of revenue for all modes of transportation. And then we have our local uh, measure that will be up for renewal, where it gives us the ability to then tap into all those other sources. A huge part of my job, and where everyone here helps and is crucial, is going back and making the case in the halls of Congress, or up in Sacramento, or regionally here through MTC, how important these projects are. So part of it is educating folks on, here's what exists. Um, you may not even know what uh, options you have now. But part of it is educating folks on, here's how you can get involved and make a difference. If we want this vision to go forward, it's not going to happen naturally. In our system, it means folks getting out, advocating. That's what I'm here for, Stephanie, others, uh, to work with you and do that. We're in a challenging situation. I don't need to tell anyone that in D.C. and elsewhere. Uh, as infrastructure packages come down the line, it's going to be critical that we have our voices heard. Can I uh, once again follow up on that? And, and Damon and Stephanie have been um, uh, critical in, in, in leading this charge. Um, it's important to look back for a minute and say we're 100 years into billions and billions and billions of dollars invested in a national highway system and, and secondary roads off of. We um, are, um, we are, we've, we've built a, a route for ourselves, so to speak, that uh, is going to require some redirection. It's what we're in the midst of now. But um, that bold approach is, is critical. It, it, it underlies whatever is going to follow. And in a place like Marin, Marin um, a wise, bold approach is sometimes also equally important. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a needle we're trying to thread at a challenging time. Um, and I guess it's given that we are so invested in the current system, it will take a little while to move this sideways and uh, establish uh, an option to what we have here and now. So what we are asking of policymakers and of those who are evaluating the effectiveness of the, the relatively small amounts of money that we're investing in bike ped infrastructure now is give it a fair chance. Uh, the whole idea that we're going to dump a little bit of money in critical improvements and expect that we're going to see changes overnight is simply not realistic. It's not what we experienced with a car. It won't happen right away with the bike. But at the same time, we are seeing real changes. And each time uh, a linkage is uh, completed, uh, the, the greenway is that much better connected, uh, we come that much closer to the long-term changes that we're all aspiring to. Can I add that? Sure. You know, said that gave all these statistics for yeah. Berkeley. You know, I've written there many, many times, and I stopped writing because it is so. The roads are in such bad shape. Absolutely. And as far as I know, the only dedicated bike lane is Gilman, and that weaves in and out, goes in and out. And like Second Street, I've had two accidents, and after that, I stopped. Right. Between Hearst and uh, Gilman. The road is just atrocious. I mean, it's worse than San Francisco, and that's saying a lot. <laughs> so, you're absolutely right. The question was, what about the, the quality of the facilities, the pavement condition, the, the alignment of the bike lanes? Uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I, I think that that kind of comes back to the resources we have to put into transportation, because our pavement quality in the city of Berkeley overall continues to slide, even as more money is becoming available and part of it is you have to strategize and spend the money well, and we're working on that. But it, I think that the amount of money is still not enough. And when we're asking voters to approve funding for transportation projects, usually it's pretty easy to get people on board with pavement quality 
but we also want to get all these other things, the, the bike-specific elements in there, and it's really important for us to get voters to recognize what's in it for them. If they view it as, I never ride a bike, I'm not going to vote for this if it's got bike stuff. That's not the kind of thinking we want. We want everyone to see that there's a benefit to them. I don't ride transit, but if I put money in transit, that'll get some people off the road, so my will get better. I want people thinking that way. Um, when we, in Alameda County, 2014, passed Measure BB to double our transportation sales tax from a half cent to a full cent, one of the things that we were discussing on the transportation commission before it went out to the voters was how to divide up the money. And historically, we've had a roughly 80% local streets and roads pavement, 10% uh, to bike and ped projects, another 10% to paratransit. And the, the bike coalition there was pushing for, let's up the bike ped component. And some of my colleagues from other cities on the commission felt like, oh, I don't think voters will go for that. They're going to feel it's taking away from cars. So my suggestion was, we'll tell you what, some of the money you spend on pavement has to go to bike and pedestrian facilities improve those those bike routes and now we, we haven't seen the, the fruition of that because it takes there's a lag in the, the delivery but that was a, a significant element of how rather than just bumping by five or ten percent we could bump by 15 percent the money going to bike and pedestrian facilities without it appearing negative to the people who didn't care about bike and pedestrian but the quality is really important and, and Again, that's why I say we've got to make the voters willing to vote for these things so we can get more. Uh, for the longest time, people used to talk about, can we get a 10 cent gas tax increase? And, and from my perspective, looking at all the externalities of driving and, and all the costs of maintaining the roads, which continue to crumble in so many places, I felt like 10 cents, why are we not talking a dollar? You know, it, it, does it have an impact? Yes. Some of that money should go to improving transit so that we have equity because people said, oh, it's, it's a regressive tax if you just, you know, throw... We, we have to solve those problems. I have a question on the gas tax. Is it possible to do local gas taxes? Because it, we have can, local sales tax. Which no is, one I, likes to do that. The, the, yeah. the perception is if we pass the local sales tax, everyone would just drive to the next city to buy their gas. But it's funny because, you know, local sales tax, we know, being in, <laughs> in Larkspur here, local sales tax keeps going up. Which is, you know, fair enough. But we tell people, you know, it's going to your bike lane, so you know, part of it at least. But so, why not? Why not gas taxes going up the same way as sales tax? So the, the way that that's done is you the local sales tax can be added to the gas. So the the state does the, the gas tax or the highway you know users fee essentially is what it is. Uh, but yeah, the the local piece is the sales tax piece, and at times the, the state has played games with some of those calculations, doing swaps. They too complicated to go into here. But, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of ways to get to it. Yeah. It seems like local control, you know, on some of this stuff. Because if a community wants to change the equation, why do, you know, waiting all around for, you know, you know so, uh, Los Angeles to decide they want to get on board on it? So I just want to chime in. We do have our own transportation sales tax. The Measure A that Damon was referring to that hopefully will be on the ballot to renew and that generates funds that Marin County itself controls and that pays for highway projects, local roads, bicycle projects, and transit. And so that is our money. And we do dedicate uh, a significant amount of funny bicycle improvements. We've also found that our uh, public works directors, when they make road improvements and road paving jobs, they have spent about 20% of their road dollars on bicycle so we actually have the money we dedicate specifically for that purpose and then the money that is used in conjunction with a complete street project. And if I could just add, I think it's important for all of us to realize we're all in this together and that when we go forward with bicycle improvements or transit, we have to understand that um, it's, it all works together with the, with the road improvements. It's not an either or, you get this money, you don't get that money. We're all in this together, and the advantages that there are to getting people out, out of their cars, they accrue to the people driving as well as the people not driving. And we just need to take a holistic approach that there aren't winners and losers. Everybody wins if we have a diverse transportation system. So, 
it does it does sometimes seem like there's maybe a, pro a framing problem on the political side because it's not. I mean, there's a framing on a lot of different levels. You can go as deep as you want. I mean, my, from my perspective, 100% of roads are are poor cars, pretty much exclusively. Uh, that seems high <laughs> in the scheme of things. When you know, it, there's there's possibilities. When I was in Europe, for instance, you know, they have ballards up that it's only local entrance to certain neighborhoods, and so there's just people walking on the you know people walking bicycles and so. And I know in South America they've done some really creative things because they they're much more constrained on budget than we are. And I know they don't probably have to go through the same environmental impacts and all this stuff. But they they have had done very like Bogota, Colombia has done incredibly bold within five years basically transforming like why where why can't we do things like that here that's a question for Jim Elias we were just talking about that <laughs> I, I saw Damon raising his hand so. <laughs> you're not going to get off the hook that easy Jim but I'll start it goes back to having that vision and as any type of projects go forward incorporating that mindset into it. So a really exciting one that's going to combine a lot of what we're talking about is the fact that the downtown center, Fellow Transit Center, actually has to be relocated when we move SMART uh, to Larkspur uh, because the tracks currently go right through it, as some of you may know. Believe it or not, that's the second busiest transit center in the whole Bay Area. 9,000 riders go through there every day, so it's crucial. So Regional Measure 3 has funding, if it passes, to uh, build a new transit center and relocate. What do we need to be looking at when we do that? Well, one thing is circulation, because right now it's unsafe around there if you're a pedestrian. There's actually been a couple of uh, fatalities right around there. We all know as cyclists, boy, you better be in top shape mentally, as not necessarily physically, to get through there. That's unacceptable. Uh, it has to be safer. I mentioned earlier this bike boulevard concept now, which is effectively turning half of Tamil Pius uh, north-south into a dedicated bike and ped throughway to, to create that safety. So... As we go forward with this larger planning, I think we're all visualizing um, better access. Let's throw in some retail, perhaps some housing. All of a sudden you have a world-class gateway to San Rafael, which originally rose out of an infrastructure necessity. We've got to move the transit center. Well, let's, let's have that vision in place as we do that. That's just one example. The vision is critical. Uh, bold movement toward the, vi the vision is critical. The differences also lie in the fact that uh, we do things differently in the U.S. in regard to how we make decisions and then implement them. That's just the reality. When we want change to occur, we sometimes wish there were a change czar. When we don't like the nature of the change, we're pretty happy about the fact that things kind of drag on and on and on through the democratic process. I think at the end of the day, the vision that we have to hang on to can be highest level in terms of what we aspire to, what it will enable for the future, but it has to start with how does it feel to me, how does it feel to a community. For me, my first attraction to bike and pet friendly places came as a result of being in them and just looking around and uh, remaining aware of how I felt. Those are the places I want to be. It turns out those are the places that a lot of people want to be. It turns out that those are the places, no offense to anyone at my age or above, but those are the places that a lot of people in the younger age groups want to be. We're moving toward a vision that we are, that we have now among many of us and that group is only growing and it comes back to the discussion in regard to e-bikes the constituency is growing the division is more widely held and our democratic process is going to lead us to the conclusion a little differently and perhaps a little more slowly than in places where the sticks and the carrots are more obvious
And I would just add, I, I think all these little victories kind of add up. Whether it's, you know, getting, getting better pavement or your go bikes or, you know, the growth in e-bike sales that we might not be operating on the grand scale of a European vision, but, the, you know, we're, we're, we're making big strides and that's really notable. Um, and it can be really easy to get discouraged, but I think, again, that it's good, like, Oakland is redoing Lake Merritt and now they're putting in a bike lane because of people, the groundswell of people biking in the area. So I think, you know, being, being excited to see the goalpost moving a little bit is also really good while holding on to that longer vision. Just as a devil's advocate to that. Let's do this. <laughs> um, the Bay Area, you know, we we seem to sometimes speak, you know, really, you know, a good game about, you know, that we care about climate change, we care about different modes and all of this stuff. And yet I know some statistics have shown recently that actually transit and bicycle riding has actually gone down in the last 10 years. Um that may, I, mean, I don't know, maybe that you don't see that in those numbers, but that's, I, I believe I've read that somewhere. What's, and maybe, let's say it just stays flat, but there's places that I know, like Seattle, um, and northern, northeastern areas, Portland, it's, it's gone up and up, and it continues to go up. What, if anything, do you think the Bay Area's got wrong, or are we, are we you know, on the cusp of something, or, or what's going on? Well, part of it is a function of a booming economy, frankly, with more people having jobs, they have money, and they choose to drive oftentimes. And I, I got to push a little bit on, look, there's Uber and Lyft. They're, they are draining off from our transit population because people want door-to-door -door service. They want the convenience. I think the groundswell that we are trying to build for active transportation is get your exercise in while you're commuting and don't just be hauled around in a car all the time. So there's a mindset change. And we, I think we will be successful in the Bay Area. It's certainly Marin County, very recreation oriented, very athletic as a community. We tend to be in better shape than a lot of communities. So just hold, hold the vision, we'll get there. <laughs> and I would add that I think what you're doing is, is taking numbers, you're throwing all the numbers in the same barrel. Uh, it changes, or it has, it varies from place to place. Take Mill Valley and the work that Stephanie uh, has has let out over the years that have culminated in a whole new Miller Avenue. You know, that is quickly becoming the new normal. Which is amazing, of, by the way. Yeah, it really, it, it's fantastic. It's safer. It's, uh, it's more convenient. Um, the, the paved uh, the roads are paved in, in such a way that you can actually uh, ride on them and, and furthermore aren't looking over your shoulder for uh, the car that's racing up behind you. They feel good. So in, in a place like Mill Valley where Safe Routes to School has been so active for so long, you're seeing real measurable improvement. And some other places that haven't been invested in in the same way, you see decline in numbers. Uh, so you know, let, let's, you know, we just, we have to pull that picture apart a little bit, examine it differently. The booming economy uh, certainly has changed things dramatically. It's been frantic. And it... Yeah, and let me, let me just, and I think we have some questions that we can get. If we just pick up on what Jim's saying, we're, we're seeing improvement. Um, I, I saw the statistic recently that over 50% of school travel is now green. Um, and that's by virtue, I think, of the Safe Routes to Schools program, uh, yellow school bus service, biking and walking. So that's mode shift because we know in the morning a significant part of traffic that we see is school generated. So it's something to build on. So I, I think it, it's tempting to just say overall the numbers may be flat, etc. But if you look a little deeper, there's stuff we can be building on. Nine to 10,000 kids are educated each year through Safe Routes to Schools. That's the next generation of bicyclists, of adults, of professionals, and of policymakers. The change is taking place. I think it's important. I just want to add one kind of anecdotal piece to that. My, my ninth grader refuses to be driven to school. He doesn't care if it's raining, if his bike's in the shop. It, it, you know, the walk or bike, every time. He's, he's made it a point, he refuses my offers for a ride if it's a bad day, he'll do it anyway. And that's because of the training and the encouragement that's come from the Safe Routes to School programs. I, I think they're tremendous. 
So we're getting near our, the end of our time here. What I would say, we should ask, we should open it up for questions. Um, I, this gentleman had the first question. So the, the questioner asked about uh, securing your bike, which is a great question. That's the, probably the second question, how much and how do I keep it safe that we get always? And the second question was about dedicated infrastructure for e-bikes. So I'll, I'll jump in because I, I ran into your question uh, after I purchased the e-bike. It's like, gee, where do I park this? I don't want to get stolen. They have extra heavy-duty locks that you can buy, but clearly as a policymaker, what came to me is we need more bike parking and more secure bike parking. So that that it will that is occurring to everyone, I think, now as, as e-bikes become popular. Yeah. On the dedicated lane for e-bikes, I will tell you, I, I traveled in Copenhagen and Amsterdam last month to look at their infrastructure. They have wonderful flat uh, cities and towns, so they, they don't need the e-bikes as much as we do in Marin because of our hills, but they are beginning to provide extra wide bicycle lanes where they will have two lanes, a slow lane and a fast lane. Uh, I think in Marin, we're gonna have to learn to coexist because we have very narrow infrastructure in general. So I, I think it will, I'm, I'm not sure that we'll be able to add second lanes everywhere, but certainly we can think about it as, as more and more people ride e-bikes. I want to add to the security piece that BART has uh, bike stations that they've got in Berkeley, Oakland, several other places, that they will uh, store your bike securely. Um, free valet bike parking is a wonderful thing. And more of that, as well as building bike parking into our building codes so that buildings are designed with that in mind. Can I do a quick shout out to Council Member Renee Goddard of Fairfax, also a huge cyclist and uh, safe mm -hmm. us to school and everything. So she, she's on the team that's making the vision happen. Good to see you, Renee. Question. Um, yes. Okay, uh, Stephanie, you mentioned uh, bike lanes. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm not going to even compare us to Copenhagen because there's light years ahead of us in terms of cycling infrastructure. But if you look at just like Sevilla, Spain, I mean, they put in uh, about, I can't remember how many miles of, of bicycle lanes, dedicated bicycle lanes, and in less than five years, they saw an 11 fold increase. So if you can go back to your 3%, imagine 3% going to 33%, or, oh, I'm sorry, 36%. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll see this happening as we finish the North-South Greenway and as local cities and towns. We've been working. It takes a while. We do it in pieces, adding these facilities. But my own prediction is that within the next five years, you will see these networks completed, and you will see the level of change and adoption of cycling that you're talking about in other cities. I will also add on the whole question comparing us to Europe, it was what Jim and I were talking about. America's diversity is a real asset in many ways, but it, it makes it more difficult to move anything forward because we don't have homogenous populations as they have enjoyed in Europe for a long time. That's changing with immigration for them, and that's a really big issue there because they've had these homogenous populations where their mindset is really similar. We have a lot of different viewpoints, and they all have to get considered, and that's why it takes longer for but us. Let me also add that uh, Sevilla uh, aggressively enforces uh, their uh, five-foot law, a five-meter law. Uh, if you, as a motorist, if you, as a motorist, um, uh, find yourself uh, uh, violating that law, and especially if you find yourself intentionally um, threatening uh, a cyclist. There are severe, severe consequences for it, and and that level of enforcement uh, is going to be part of the the picture going out toward uh, making people not just really safe. I mean, not just safe in reality, but feel safe. Okay, you mentioned the Miller bike lane, uh, Jim, and that's really great. But you know, if you put the bike lane on the other side, on the right side of the parked cars, 
It would have, and we couldn't get community consensus to do it. So we did the best we could. This is the thing. It's a compromise. Yeah, but it's better Incremental than nothing. democracy. Yeah. to love cycling too. That's the other important thing. Just to reiterate, the questioner asked about how do we, we have good infrastructure, how do we make people the cultural change, basically? I thought you were going to Alto Tunnel. I thought you were going to Alto Tunnel. That's the next step, isn't it? I will. <laughs> Until we have separated bike facilities everywhere, or unless, um, it comes back to the, the feeling of traffic safety and how we're managing traffic. And if we compare to you know, countries in Europe where there's a zero tolerance against drunk driving, as an example, um, we don't have that. You know, I, I you know, hear ads on the radio. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Right. We, we, we've got a robust traffic calming policy and program, but again, what it comes down to is the cultural change of changing the culture of driving, because driving right now is the big threat to the pedestrians, to the cyclists, to everyone, and if there's not adequate enforcement, if there's not a feeling that we as individuals have to follow the driving laws, as was mentioned by Jim, um, we're, we're not going to feel safe when we're not in the car. Well, and if you do look at the Netherlands, I mean, one thing they push is it's not only driver mentality, uh, keeping your eyes out for cyclists, but it's a cyclist mentality as well. Uh, staying safe and, and keeping your eyes out as well for cars. So we do a pretty good job of that in Marin. I think you're right, but, you know, we can we can always do better as well. So so I would hop in real quickly. Thank you for getting involved with Safe Routes, too. That. I am, Mill Valley is going to put some new lanes in this year on Camino Alto, and we will pretty much have lanes where we can put them on our major arterials. When that happens, I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable bugging my friends, and that's what you need to do. We all need to bug our friends and say, why aren't you riding your bike on this thing? So I think there's personal that happens, and then I think we were talking that the more people ride, the more people will ride, right? So we just got to do the personal invitation and then bug people. I, I also wonder, I mean, it seems like just knowing about the ferry, for instance, the ferry doesn't seem to do a particularly good job of, of really communicating just how easy it is to cycle. Like, they, they mention it, maybe, in passing. I... But they don't, you know, they did a whole blast about recently on Twitter about, you know, how full their parking is and now they have a shuttle bus. Wow. But they didn't even say anything about the fact that you can bike. That's really great, Brett. I think uh, the first, last month, we need to co-market with our fellow transit agencies about how to work together. And marketing yeah. is powerful. And I think, you know, if you put a big billboard up there and said, hey, this is how long it takes you to get to San Anselmo on a bicycle. This yeah. is how long it takes you on an electric bicycle. Yeah. Compare that to your times. 
And we, maybe the MTA commissioner would choose to yep. electric bicycle to... How many calories burn? Yeah, all that. how yeah. good you feel in the sunshine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, for example, my commute to the office, which isn't too bad, is probably 10-minute car, 15-minute bike, 20-minute wow. transit. So pick your choice in that. Yeah. The challenge is then I'm all over the Bay Area in yeah. any given week or day, and that's where I'm getting a lot of personal input and hearing from others kind of how, how we can improve things and, and what's working as well. Yeah. The question is about Alto Tunnel. Yeah. Um, we've got another hour, right? <laughs> um, A minute. It's, uh, uh, so as for where we are now, uh, the engineering study was completed. Uh, the price tag for reopening and reinforcing the tunnel estimated to be in the $44, $47 million range. When the decision is made to go forward with uh, the project, the next step would be to look for the money. Most of that money, if not all of it, would come from uh, grants outside of, I mean to say, uh, pots of money outside of Marin County. I'm not going to lie to you. Those pots are not just uh, lying out there for us to go uh, uh, access but we could compete for them. And it's a very strong project. It's a very attractive project that promises to move a lot of people and take real numbers of cars off the road. So the next step is, is really uh, uh, organizing uh, the community-based support to provide the voice to the decision makers that says, we're ready. We're, we're ready to go forward with this. The resistance that's coming is sometimes coming in, in, uh, in, in various forms, but uh, the, the information that uh, accompanies that resistance isn't always uh, fact-checkable. Maybe it's coming from the national level, I don't know. And, and I, I just want to chime in. As a policymaker, the, the Alto Tunnel is our most expensive bicycle improvement. And it has always made sense to me to work on the ones we're working on that are cheaper, get the kind of ridership that shows that that justifies spending the dollars on the Alto Tunnel. I'm convinced we'll get there, but I but I think we have to do this in kind of a logical sequence and demonstrate that we're going to use these facilities. And we haven't had the numbers on our facilities. The, the Cal Park Tunnel is a wonderful example. Until it gets connected at either end really well, we're not going to see the usership. So, to me, it, it will happen, it's just a matter of time. I would say too, I think so much of it is, the gentleman earlier, it's about you know, working with your bicycle coalition and making your voice heard, um, supporting you when you guys go out and work for these projects where people know that, they, that there is a groundswell of people who want these to happen and also voting in June, November. I mean, that's how we really get the funding and you know, the louder the voices, the more likely we are to move these projects forward. I just want to make a quick, quick announcement. Uh, lunch service has begun. So just we're going a little over here with questions, but I just wanted to make sure everyone understood lunch is being served. Sweetwater, uh, cough, uh, Sweetwater's Music Hall is, has some delicious things on the menu, so go check that out. Um, let's do just a few more questions, and then uh, we're going to wrap it up. Taking your bike on the ferry about a year ago, I was told no electric bikes. Is that still the case? The question was about ferry access, electric bike ferry. I can just speak to that a little bit. I know the issue in Sausalito was taking it upstairs. Um, Larkspur doesn't have that issue, but they did a blanket policy for everything, um, which is a little bit, was a little maybe short sighted. <laughs> Obviously. Right, so yeah, so I don't know. What Does anyone know about this? Don't know, but I, I see that changing. I mean, that's going... I, mean, I was going to sneak my bike on <laughs> because it doesn't look like an electric bike, but then I get in the city and they're like, they kick, you know... I can, would, I can say that I take my electric bike on the fair, on the large ferry all the time and no one cares. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I've heard the same. So it's a policy that they don't enforce. It's a policy that they don't enforce. And I, and I have heard also, we've talked to the ferry and they are they're looking at changing it. So I think 
and it will be changed in Sausalito once they get the new uh, boarding in place, probably. I can't speak for the ferry, though. Yeah, and Damon and I can take this back to our colleagues on the Golden Gate Fer Transit and Ferry Board to say this is one that needs to be revised. Last question. Paul. Oh. I'll go to get a go bike, and there won't be any bikes there. Very, right, you know, like people are really, they're really using them. I think you're really starting to see a shift. Uh, um, the, the, yeah. the bike gridlock's not at all far fetched. I already don't use the, our bike path because they're so congested. From my perspective, I want to go faster. I'm on the street with the road, so I'm probably one of the cyclists you know, who's being complained about by drivers. But as we expand the capacity for cycling on all of our roads, that's really the, the first step in addressing that problem, is provide more capacity. I think one cool thing about the United States versus Europe is we have lots of roads, and they're usually very, very wide, so there's so much room to expand into. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just add, you know, congestion is going to be with us as long as there's people <laughs> and we're all commuting at the same time. We're going to have congestion. And I think our options at that point are figure out, can you go off peak time? Do you need to be in the middle of that congestion, whether it's on a bike or on a car? And B, do you need to make that trip at all? So I, I do think it's incumbent on all of us to figure out what, when our transit options, uh, wh when's a good time to go and what's a good route to take and then just get on out and do it. And frankly, I love what that problem shows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, the, al the, al the alternative is, is a whole lot worse in every regard. And there are European cities that are grappling with this now. Chapeau, that's fantastic. And yeah, no tailpipe emissions when they're stuck when you're stuck yeah. in bicycle traffic. Exactly. <laughs> We're all figuring out how to live with one another. That's going to go on in one form or another in, in regard to transportation, but it, it goes on in regard to how we all, I mean, how we're always functioning and, and trying to make our way through finite space. I mean, it really is to some degree a matter of how we behave as people. <laughs> so I think with that, it is the conclusion of our first policy panel. I want to thank our esteemed panelists so much. This was so fantastic to have all of you here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brett.